Recording has started. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, next up we have uh, Central Washington University. How does the solar eclipse affect the Earth's atmosphere? With that, um, take it away. So, hi, everyone. Yeah, we're the um, Hal C. Balloon team at Central Washington University. And, you know, like most other atmospheric science teams, this is the question that we wish to address um, by the end of this project. Um, so we traveled down to Southern Oregon and Chiloquin um, to do our data collection, got a great view um, of the eclipse. And so I'm just going to talk about how, um, how we went through and did our data collection. Um, so the day after we got there, began collecting data about 9.14 a.m. Um, preceding the eclipse, and then, you know, went 30, 31 hours, and then collection ended at 3 p.m. the following day. Um, and so we were launching a balloon every hour from this um, beginning time to the end time. Um, and so we kind of had, had a little bit of a janky setup. We were just at the parking lot um, of a school down in Chiloquin, very, very, very small town. Um, so that, that made it challenging in some ways. And we also uh, ran into some inclement weather. Um, you know, so we just had our, you know, had our tents, had our tables, we had our three computers, our laptops, and then we had all of our ground stations. And the way we had this set up was uh, all the ground stations were usually going at once. So we would be launching and collecting data for three balloons um, at once. And that kind of helped us so that we didn't have to cut off data collection early to launch another balloon. So that helped everything flow really nicely. Um, I think we only had to cut off data collection early for maybe two launches. Um, so we did get we did get some pretty good data. And so one other important thing to talk about is we had some inclement weather. So our launch conditions were a little iffy. Um, you know, it was cold, but mostly clear when we got there. Then it rained the entire night before the eclipse. And then um, eclipse day, it was cloudy, but there was no rain um, during totality. So here you can see an image that we got. Um, so everyone that was there could see the eclipse perfectly well, didn't even need glasses um, for safe viewing. Um, so this was really, really cool for us to see it like this. Um, but this also did give us some challenges in um, analyzing our data. And so we will also talk about that. Yeah, so we collected uh, usable data from every single launch that we got. Um, which is awesome. Um, so obviously our radio sound data and also all of the data from our weather station. And so what we did with this is um, we created skew T diagrams for every single launch. And so this image is just an example skew T that we made um, using uh, the Python codes that we got from the University of Idaho. Um, so yeah, this one, this one's a good example of uh, a flight that was good, um, no issues with it. Uh, so we got, we got a lot of those guys. And then, so we also had the left weather station going to get ground uh, conditions. And we measured a number of things, including the air temperature and the amount of sunlight incident on the top of the weather station. And uh, we used that data in, and the Python code to, or a Python code to plug it into a graph. And so these two graphs are for the night before the eclipse, during the eclipse, and the several hours afterwards. And as you can see, the air temperature, uh, it wasn't quite precise enough to really get the minute change in temperature. But part of that was probably because it was cloudy out. So the temperature didn't change a whole lot during and after totality. But uh, the amount of sunlight uh, did change. So totality happened uh, right around record number 76,000. So as you can see, the, uh, the amount of sunlight is slowly going up, but then at totality, it drops back down. And then after totality, it goes back up. And then later you can see all the clouds make the amount of sunlight super variable. And then this is just a, a quick little breakdown of the data quality by the launch. So we ended up with 31 launches and two thirds of them had great data. Uh, about seven or eight of them had uh, 
av what we call the average data where there were some jumps in the in the data as you saw in the the first uh one of the first skew t diagrams and then three of them actually had poor data and we're attributing that to we believe during the launch the radio sonde actually connected to a different uh ground station and so there were huge jumps in the where it thought it was so it would all of a sudden climb several thousand feet um, and so some of our observations were because of the clouds, the eclipse had less of an effect on the height of the planetary boundary layer than we were hoping to see. And the jumps in data were caused by uh, radio sons connecting to different ground stations than the ones they were supposed to be connected to. And then, so for the data analysis, we used some the skew T diagrams that were generated. And then we used some planetary boundary layer height code that we got from Idaho. And we used those to kind of estimate and find the planetary boundary layer before and after the eclipse. So this graph here is using some of that code and it does the three methods of determining the height of the planetary boundary layer and then it uses an algorithm to choose the best one and so that's the the black line you see is where it shows the planetary boundary layer to be um, and then we analyze some of that weather station data uh, as you saw and then we're comparing the weather station data to the balloon data to see how the conditions differed on the ground versus in the air. And then our next steps uh, moving on are going to be to continue the kind of general analysis of the code, uh, clean it up a little bit more, and then create plots for the weather station data because we got a whole bunch more. We got uh, stuff like potential temperature, air temperature, um, stuff like that, and then clean up the plots that we already have, and then compare skew T data that we got with uh, actual weather models that we have access to from that eclipse date to see how the eclipse actually compares to what it was expected to be on a normal day without an eclipse, and then prepare for the eclipse in April. So continue practicing launches, um, revise our checklists, our launch checklists and launch procedures and continue updating our code to hopefully get better data in April. And that is our presentation. Any questions? All right, thank you. Any questions? I have one. Um, does your weather station really only read to the nearest degree? That's just hard to believe. Uh, it goes to, I believe, the nearest tenth of a degree. But your data kept jumping between five degrees, six degrees, four degrees. As if it was reading just to the nearest degree. Um, actually, yeah. So, yeah, that is the that's the most precise data it gave us um that's part of our preparing for april is to see if we can get the weather station to read more precisely um, yes, check with other people who use that same weather station yeah. it seems to me you're not you're not getting the most use out mm -hmm. of it yeah yeah i was kind of curious on what the sample rate was like how often it's taking that temperature reading. So uh, it's taking recordings every two seconds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Let me throw out one more. Uh, you, you suspected yeah. you had radio interference. Do you know that's for sure? Were there other people nearby? Um, we, the radio interference we're suspecting is uh, from our other ground stations. So we had all three ground stations right next to each other because we didn't have a whole lot of space 
and a whole lot of uh, freedom with outlets. We only have one outlet and one power strip. So um, what would happen is the radio sound would be acting normal and then it would just connect to what we believe another one and there'd be a super huge jump. Um, so for April, we are going to try and spread the ground stations out better so there's less interference and try and get them farther apart on the radio frequency as well. I'm going to hazard a guess that other teams either struggled with that or didn't struggle with that because they know something that you don't know about spreading the frequencies. So talk to other teams about that one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other last minute questions? If not, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Great job with it. So thank you.